Welcome Waste Builders to the latest 10 minute episode of Audio from Waste Build and another chance to hear from those leading the transition towards a circular built environment. Here we have another presentation from the panel discussion about the business case for circular developments. This time presented by Ignacy Fabina from Eco Intelligent Growth, which is a follow on from our previous speaker, Falkert Mole from KPMG. If you've missed it, you can also catch Falkert's session on the website, wastebuild.com. But in the meantime, Ignacy, it's over to you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Fokker, for handing it to me. Good timing. Uh, well, I'm going to make it short because uh, all the way from Barcelona yesterday. And uh, I want to deliver something from a practitioner view. I'm in the cradle to cradle wall. I'm one of the oldest guys in the cradle to cradle wall. I mean, probably some of you have already seen some presentations of either Michael Branger or Willem McDonough or the course of Hariase. I'm in this business, in this business since uh, 2005 when I founded the company, so it's a pretty long way. The main thing I found about cradle to cradle and cradle to cradle practitioner in pro the Netherlands is probably the best spot for cradle to cradle examples in the world in terms of concentration of what is happening, right? But cradle to cradle, the ambition of cradle to cradle takes it much broader than that. And one of the things we have been, uh, 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 well, finding through our um, through our journey is that. Becoming a cradle-to-cradle -cradle practitioner is not only about certifying products, it's not only about uh, putting safety first, it's not only about trying to see what is, how to capture the value for enhanced uh, uh, safety, material circulation, and so, forth, so on. But cradle-to-cradle -cradle, uh, needs to be done, it needs to happen. And that's why um, we believe cradle-to-cradle -cradle is, is the good design and verification tool for the circular economy at the product level. Because it's a real practical approach in the end of the day. So the, the, the thing I was missing always from a cradle-to-cradle -cradle perspective was the case study. Okay, what is the financial value of doing cradle-to-cradle? -cradle? How we can capture this value in a world where when we do metrics in terms of uh, how to assess circularity of products or process, we use the life cycle assessment, which has never been defined for a circular economy model. So we need to break the rules. And when we break the rules and we go to the fundamentals of that, the first thing that comes to my mind is that the only universal rules we know they work for a long time are the biosphere rules. So the rules from the natural world. So just Duncan just mentioned that we live in the Anthropocene world. And uh, most of the value, especially the natural capital value, is being produced in the natural world. And, well, just very recently, I found from a professor in the US, Gregory Unruth, he just uh, wrote a book. I don't have the book with me, by the way, so don't, you don't have to rush. Uh, and he was talking about the biosphere rules and how to use the biosphere rules as um, as a roadmap for uh, circularity, eh? in the broader extent of circularity. So he was looking at five main attributes of these rules, five main rules, um, material parsimony, value cycling, power autonomy, circular material platforms, and function over form. I don't want to make it very theoretical here, you know. I just want to go through all these uh, different attributes. And how all these attributes, just by chance, is that we have been embedding in our Lean to Cradle methodology that we are already practitioner in Spain. In our company, I'm part of a general contractor holding group of companies. We're doing um, annual revenues of 100 million euros. This year already, 25% of this revenue comes from circular economy building projects. And this is probably one of the highest rates in Europe, by the way. And we are in Spain, when we were suffering a lot from recession, and we didn't have this, this strength of the community you have in the Netherlands. So if you can do 25% in Spain, you should be doing 50% in the Netherlands already. Let's put it simply, okay? And by the way, you have a minister of circular economy, you have this 2030 challenge, and the 2050 uh, uh, deadline, you know? So you're doing a lot of good things on that, but in the end of the day, you need to put your hands on and deliver. 
So what is material parsimony? Material parsimony is what nature does best than any, anybody else. Because nature, through evolution, and my biology is my education, only takes what has been proven after more than three billion years. So what it, nature, the material selection process of nature is extremely effective. Not in time, but it's very consistent. So the cradle-to-cradle -cradle certification or the cradle-to-cradle -cradle vision tends to get inspired by nature in a way that we are looking at the safety of things first. When I'm hearing people talking about circular economy, most of the people, they think about material reutilization, material reuse, material repurposing, but hey, there's no circular economy without safety products and safety materials and safety molecules in the first place. I mean, the worst thing we can do, and Michael, I mean, uh, Bill McDonald was telling that in Stockholm one month ago, is that we start circulating the batch. Circulating the batch is worse than, I mean, using a linear system. So if we are moving batch around, we better stay with our linear model. Forget about the circular model. Because if, when we are circulating batch, we are not creating value, and we are not retaining any value. Hmm? So identification, molecular level, in order to be consistent when we declare something is safe, and then try and, I mean, identifying the product and qualifying the product, whether it should go to the biosphere or the technosphere. And if there is room for optimization or there's need for optimization, I mean, you go upstream for optimization. So you have to go to the supply chain, by the way, to get their uh, transparency and their cooperation in order to make things happen beforehand. Material passports. How many of you have ever been uh, involved in a material passport definition? Good. This is the Netherlands. Love to see that. Well, we, we have been working with material passports for almost uh, more than three years now. We have probably one of the most detailed material passport system for a whole building, not, for just pro not just for products, but for a whole building, because we go down to the 100 ppm level that is the identification threshold from the cradle to cradle perspective. So we are not identifying materials, we are not even identifying nutrients. We're going down to the molecular level. Because in the end of the day, somebody was saying, okay, in 2030 nobody's gonna be here. Yes, molecules are going to be here. And this is what we have to put in the, in the first place. This is the natural capital we have to retain the value for. So the value cycling in a material passport is about how to define material value in the first place, so at the uh, execution phase, and in a dynamic system, whether we are able to have the value of the different components of the building throughout the use cycle of the building. By the way, I don't speak life cycle, because how many living things are in a building? The people, the plants, some bugs. But I mean, construction materials are not living things. So we should start thinking about changing the language a little bit as well. So in the end of the day, the building has different financial assets. And one of the assets is what we call the residual value. Sorry for the uh, uh, diagram here, which is in terms of the financial value of a building is the most challenging thing. The residual value is not just, I mean, the, um, the reminder value in the building in the, end of the, in the end of the use cycle. It also captures the different value and the different value of the different retrofitting of the building, you know? So the important thing about a material bank, and I remember when I was talking to the Delta guys, Delta, the, the power of 2020, they said, already two years ago, they said, okay, Financial people, they are interested when you say that you can have a residual value in your, in your balance sheet of approximately 20%. Hmm? The circle, the ABN Amro building, I think they were talking about backing on a, for a loan, it was something like 5% of residual value. So the gap between the 5% and this 20% is what the private sector has to develop.
is anybody, has anybody done a real deconstruction project in an existing, in existing building of more than 1,000 square meters? The only database available in Europe that the price index is the database existing in Spain from ETEC. That, by the way, they have just received a United Nations. One minute, OK, I have to rush a little bit. So the importance of the construction is because in the, in the final cost of materializing the value of the, of the building, the deconstruction cost is going to kill us. Because most of those buildings, they have never been assembled for making the construction easy. So keeping in mind the deconstruction cost from the design phase into the use phase and then the final reutilization phase is critical. Because otherwise, in this residual value, when you have to deduct the deconstruction cost, you're, you're out. 45%, and I have, I have uh, to rush a little bit, 45% of all the climate change, according to McKinsey and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, is related to products. This is from one month ago. We're all focusing on the use of energy in the, in the use phase, but at least 45%, and this is only taking into consideration four construction materials, steel, concrete, plastic, and, uh, um, and uh, I think it's uh, iron? No, aluminum, aluminum. And what does natural does? The most important thing about circular economy is not material flow, is not energy flow, is relationship flow. So circular economy is about building new relationships. We are building a relation with KPMG. We are very happy about it. I'm very proud of that. And this is the key. The key is how you build relationships. So developing material platforms in collaboration is about also how to develop new business models. Yeah? Paper use, uh, paper performance, uh, extended producer liability, uh, the ownership uh, 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 resides in the, in the manufacturer. And this is the last one, David. Uh, so all these might look very theoretical to some of you guys. The reality is that we are developing a roadmap for a company, which was is a mid-sized company in Spain. So this also for the SME companies, by the way, is the 10 years roadmap. We are in the seventh year. Next year, our expectations are to be 40% of all our projects, either retail, commercial, new construction, 80% of our activities retrofitting existing buildings. And then, looking at the financial life cycle, or use cycle. Should be use cycle, by the way, here. I'm, I'm shooting my feet now. So, and why is this so important? Because you know who is paying the bill? If we want to move the needle in the right direction, we need investors with us. How many investors are here in the room? Any investor? You see what I mean? This is an approach for investors. I think most of you probably you are good experts, you are motivated people, you have been working on this already. But sorry guys, in the end of the day, this is not for you. Because the key, key thing here, and what we need to do, is to get money using different priorities. That's why we need KPMG with us. We know how to roll into cradle, but we need to take this message to those guys that can make a real difference. And the difference, by the way, is not 2030, is not 2025, it's tomorrow. The difference is today. The difference is that uh, while the, the black rocks of the wall, they should acknowledge that there's a different way of doing things. Thank you. Many thanks again to all our contributors from last year and to you for listening and being part of this circular transition for the built environment. We really look forward to seeing you at the NDSM in Amsterdam this November. Do visit the website www.wastebuild.com and keep an eye out for the next release of content from the 2019 event and our brand new audio content coming soon. So until next time, stay safe and bye-bye.